from celebrities. And don't do that. Don't be like that. It's amazing to see it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, right away. I texted Brett this morning. I was like, hey, I'm pregnant. Well, now it's a dog. Now it's a dog. But that's what you got. No. And so don't do that. And it's like, if you thought it was a dog. Now, I have a friend who yeah. had was born on April Fool's, and she was like four weeks premature. So she was like, her dad was trying to call everyone and be like, hey, uh, like, Joanne went into labor. And they were like, ha ha, nice joke, Sean. You're four weeks early. Good try, though. It's like, no, my daughter is literally, like, this is good, guys. <laughs> I mean, my, I move, uh, <laughs> my birthday's not graduation. My birthday's like the week after your birthday. Yeah. My mom says we're going to be so That's fine. Take her up on that. We're good? It's yep. going. Oh, someone's watching. Yeah. Oh, it's really. Oh, well, someone's watching. Oh, yeah. Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to Ripon College. Thank you for all. Thank you all for being here today. We greatly appreciate your attendance, and I'm sure active participation. Um, I also want to welcome those who are watching this event all over the world uh, via the Ripon College uh, Live Events channel. I'm Henrik Schatzinger, and uh, I'm the co-director of the Center for Politics and the People. Today's event is sponsored by the CPP, the College Publicans, and Ducks Unlimited. It is my honor to introduce our guest uh, and speaker, Benji Backer. Let me just tell you a little bit of a story in terms of how Benji got here today. Uh, the CPP was interested in doing an event on the environment and sustainability, and uh, we also wanted to get someone who is younger, because younger speakers often attract a younger crowd, as we can see here today. And so um, it was at uh, the dinner table but that my wife and I were wondering who could be uh, um, invited. And so my wife went on Googling uh, and she found the Grist magazine top 50 environmentalists and most innovative individuals. And guess who was on that list? Uh, Benji Backer. Now initially we didn't realize that Benji is a Wisconsin native from Appleton, but then we figured that out and since my wife knows a lot of people here in Wisconsin. She went on Facebook and found, in fact, a mutual friend uh, who's also here today, uh, John Beach, who then gave us Benji's phone number. And so there was the connection, and now Benji is here. So 21-year-old uh, Benji Backer is founder and president of the American Conservation Coalition, the ACC. He will discuss how to make a political impact at a young age, and he will reflect on his personal path from being active in a quite conservative movement, the Tea Party movement, um, to finding ways on how to reach across the aisle after creating the ACC. He will also make the case for the significance of uh, conservation and sustainability, and how he uh, tries to achieve his goals with the, with the ACC. Uh, yeah, Benji's background, he's a conservative activist from Appleton, as I already mentioned, and he's also a junior at the University of Washington. He serves on the Wisconsin uh, Cons Conservative Energy Forum Leadership Council, and he's also a fellow at the Chapman Center in Seattle. Uh, he previously served as the co-chairman for Young Americans for Mitt Romney in Wisconsin, and he was also named one of the Red Alert's top 30, under 30 conservatives in 2015. Uh, he has also uh, written various um, pieces for news outlets, including uh, CNBC, Town Hall, Daily Caller, Red State, The Blaze, and others. And he's also speaking a lot around the country, including uh, two appearances at CPAC in 2014 and 2016. Uh, Benji just uh, um, visited another um, event in, in Nashville, and he will actually be this week, he will be giving testimony in, in Congress. So um, he's traveling quite, uh, quite a bit. Um, so through ACC, um, Benji is excited to help United American, United Americans on pro-environmental reforms and change the narrative when it comes to the environment. 
after this talk, there will be time for questions. So please join me in welcoming Benji Backer. seeing the posters around uh, here in Ripon, I had to take some double takes because this is just such a crazy topic and kind of crazy to even look at for someone who has lived through it like I have. Um, and so I think it's really important to kind of preface that before we get into it, that this is something that, uh, that the environment is not something that should be partisan and it's something that we all should care about a lot. Uh, and I'm going to go into that. First, I'm going to talk about kind of my life through politics and how I evolved from the Tea Party to sustainability. Um, talk a little bit about the divisive politics that we see here in the United States, and obviously Wisconsin's been at the heart of a lot of it. Um, and also talk about how anyone can make a difference based on what I have gone through in my short 21 years of life, um, which over half of it has been involved in politics, uh, which is also crazy to say. Um, and so I'll start out by saying this. It's obvious that Americans are very divided right now. Uh, you look at the media, you look at politicians, um, and the stereotypes that surround everyone in politics, it's pretty bad, um, especially in the Trump era and even before that. Uh, the divisiveness is kind of at an all-time high, at least in my lifetime, and I've heard from others that it's at an all-time high for a lot of people's lifetimes. Um, and obviously both parties are as divided as ever. Um, but I want to use the story that, I've been, that I can tell and the experiences that I've been able to have as hopefully some sort of inspiration uh, that this polarization, polarization can come to an end and that it is kind of coming to an end behind the scenes, uh, despite what the media and, and other outlets will try to tell you. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the preface of, of where we're going to go today. But I first wanted to start out by asking, and I asked a bunch of classrooms this today because I went around and talked to some classes today, and I heard some perceptions of conservatives and the environment from students, and some of them are here tonight, but I'd also love to hear from everyone else that's here on some of the perceptions that you have of conservatives in the environment, whether you are conservative or you're not, or you have a negative perception or a positive perception. I'd love to hear some of those for anybody who, who has a perception to share. Yes? Well, just off the top of my head, I just never thought of the word conservative and the word environmental go together. Never thought of conservative and environmental going together? Anything else? Yeah? I mean, I've recently seen a growing change. I'm pretty conservative um, of conservative hunters not appreciating what the state DNR has, has done, and they're starting to awaken a lot of environmental issues and saying, wait, like, we don't know who to elect. Uh, we, don't, we don't care for the Democratic Party's platform, but we don't like what the GOP is doing for our natural resources. So yeah. it's something that I've noticed lately. Yeah, so conservative hunters being frustrated by um, the party on this issue. Yeah. Uh, to expand exactly on that, I work for the Department of Natural Resources for the Water and Wetlands Wet waterway and wetlands program. And, well, thank um, you, first of all. No problem. And uh, Ducks Unlimited was a very essential organization in bringing conservative stakeholders to commit to, to influence the politicians last year on a very negative anti-wetland piece of legislation called Act 23. Mm -hmm. and sure. Through the efforts of Ducks Unlimited, reaching out to its conservative uh, well, not all talks of the people are conservative, but a lot of them are. But mm -hmm. because of them, they were actually able to vastly decrease the effects of Act 183 into a much more manageable piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. Sure, no, that's great too. Anything else? Yeah, so I mean, those are great. And some of the other stereotypes that I heard and kind of perceptions were that, you know, climate change denial. Um, not even like thinking that there are environmental issues, uh, conservatives not thinking that there are environmental issues, being you know 
basically only pro uh, drilling and not really caring about anything else related to that. So I thought that those were really interesting perceptions and things that I hear a lot when I travel around and, I, and I'm working on this movement, um, the American Conservation Coalition that we're doing is, is kind of bringing people back into those discussions. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of tackle why those perceptions aren't true later on, but I also wanted to ask um, by a show of hands, how many of you guys think climate change activists are some of the most environmentally friendly people in the country? Uh, just by a show of hands. What do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll also expand on that. So, but most hands went up. Not, my hand isn't going up until I understand the question. <laughs> sure. So, so that, but most hands did go up, and I will ex I will expand on that in a little bit. So, I think that both of those showcase kind of uh, unique perceptions that are important to talk about, and I also will talk about that as we go forward. Uh, but first, a little bit about me. I did grow up in Appleton. I graduated from Appleton North High School in 2016. Uh, I'm a junior at the University of Washington, um, and really have kind of seen both sides of the aisle, because I grew up as a Tea Party um, activist in Wisconsin during the recall elections, and I also am now a conservative environmentalist, which is you know, sometimes clashing, and I'm a conservative in Seattle, so seeing kind of both sides of uh, the coin has been really interesting to me. Um, I'm a big Wisconsin sports fan and still follow it uh, out there in Seattle. Um, paid way too much to go to the Seahawks-Packers game this last year out in Seattle, um, especially since they lost. And, uh, but I've been active in politics since I was 10 years old. I was knocking on doors uh, for different local candidates and national and statewide candidates at age 10. Uh, I actually forced my parents to put uh, bumper stickers on our cars and signs in our yards, uh, which they did, or yard, which they really didn't like because uh, they were not very politically active. Um, but I was just very passionate about it at a young age. And uh, the first campaign that I got to work on was Roger Roth's um, uh, U.S. Congress campaign in 2008, uh, I believe, or 10, 10. Um, and that was really interesting because I was doing phone calling, and people would always kind of question me as I was phone calling, because I had a really high-pitched voice at the time, uh, as a 10-year-old or 12-year-old, and uh, it was just really interesting to hear the reaction of, of such a young activist being on the phone uh, at that time. And uh, so, and then I also got to see the impact that people can have at, uh, in politics because I helped an assembly campaign that won an election by 27 votes. And I knew that every volunteer on that staff uh, contributed enough to make the difference of those 27 votes. And so I got to see firsthand how much of a difference in one individual can make um, on a campaign trail and how important it is to get active in those communities. So I grew up in that and I ended up getting kind of involved in the Tea Party uh, at age 12, uh, actually at age 12 and 14. I did the National Tea Party Express Tour in Wisconsin, um, did it in Wausau and Appleton, um, and, and they wanted me to go further, but I had school. Um, and so that was really interesting too, because I got to really get my first start speaking on those tours. But I was kind of used as a pawn, and I, and I realized that later on because I was so young and they wanted a, a young activist to kind of showcase how much support they had from the youth. Um, and I got to see that pretty early on. I got to see really through the national politics some of the negativity and divisiveness that really haunts the political system currently. Um, and I was treated very divisively by the far, far left at the time too. Um, our house was egged and um, I got death threats. and. Um, really felt unsafe leaving the house, and this is an Appleton, right? So it's crazy that, you know, that divisiveness could transcend to someone so young, um, but I had to see that very young as well. Um, thankfully, that made me stronger because uh, I had really supportive parents and people around me, um, but that was something that showcased why maybe the divisive politics had gone to an all-time high, and that was before the Trump era, so a really interesting anecdote there. Um, and so then, kind of going through that and seeing how divisive it was for both sides, um, I decided to take a break from politics when I was a senior in high school. And um, then when Trump won uh, the primary, I felt the Republican primary, um, I wasn't the biggest fan of him, and, and so I wanted to go out and write and, and talk about how as a conservative uh, we wanted a, a, an alternative. Um, and at that time, um, the, uh, I saw the other side come after.
after me. I had uh, the alt-right uh, go after me on campus and also give me death threats out in Washington. So uh, that was during my freshman year, um, just because of my disdain for Trump. So it was very interesting kind of going through my life, being able to see the divisive political culture from the polarized far left and far right um, that a lot of people have to deal with and is kind of, again, haunting our democracy at this point in time. Um, and so that's what kind of led me to the environmental movement and why I thought that this was something that needed to be done and why more people need to get more people needed to get involved in a bipartisan way to try to improve our political discussions um, and the way that we go about the dialogue in this country. Um, so I first started an organization called Conservatives for Environmental Reform. And it was a pretty political organization, it was actually a PAC, um, kind of exploring how successful could this issue be? How successful could conservatives who care about the environment? I grew up in a very environmentally conscious household. Uh, we, we always recycled and we went to national parks and we went to state parks and that, those, that's where we went to relax and take vacations. And I was always very frustrated by the lack of conservative involvement. And so uh, conservatives for environmental reform had a lot of success because a lot of other young people felt the same way I did. Um, that the conservative movement wasn't making a big enough priority. Um, so I thought that that was a really good sign. Um, and before I kind of go into what we're doing, I want to talk a little bit about the, the <coughs> political divide that we're in now. Um, and again, kind of going back to being in Seattle and also being from Appleton and seeing the radicals from both sides and being in, in a, a very diverse place in Seattle, um, I've been able to see a lot of the stereotypes, obviously we talked about some of those on the environment, but I've been able to see some of the stereotypes of conservatives and liberals being incredibly wrong. Um, and I want to share a couple of those with you because I think it's important to break those as much as possible. Um, the first one is, uh, and, and this, all of these are, are very interesting, the first one is immigration. Um, obviously growing up here, uh, it's a fairly conservative place. Um, in some ways, and, and, and obviously groups I, I was interacting with were fairly conservative. Um, but I was able to see that people who wanted stronger borders weren't anti-immigrant and weren't racist. And, and so I think that that's a unique perspective that I was able to bring to people out in Seattle who thought the opposite. And even though I might disagree with them on maybe a wall or whatever it may be, I also knew firsthand that those people were just, you know, I, I knew immigrants that were against or that were for a wall. And so being able to share that was really interesting. On gay rights, I knew that most conservatives were, especially in my age group, were for um, gay rights. And uh, you know, sharing that in Seattle was something that a lot of people hadn't heard of before. And, uh, and I think just being able to see that was really important. And then on the environmental side, um, I hung out with a group of environmental uh, presidents and CEOs this past summer, and I was the only conservative there and I was able to break that stereotype with them as well. Um, and on the opposite side, you know, now as somebody who is involved pretty heavily with, with left of center politics and right of center politics, I've been able to talk a lot about you know, how both stereotypes aren't always true. And I think it's really important to look past stereotypes when we're looking at the political di dialogue and discourse and kind of look past some of the polarizing figures in the news and media that make it seem like everyone believes one thing or another and that these stereotypes are true and a lot of times they're not. Um, and, but that leads me to talk about kind of the environmental movement and why I think that that polarization has also become an issue and the stereotypes of conservatives isn't always right. Um, so, the environmental movement for a while has been fairly partisan. Um, not one Republican on the national level was endorsed by the League of Conservation Voters or the Sierra Club during the past election. And there are a lot of really great Republicans on the environment um, who are standing up for things that deserve to be endorsed and deserve to be supported. Um, so I think that that's a really interesting um, thing that unfortunately hasn't been embraced by a lot of people in the environmental community. Um, not all, but, but certain groups. And it also has become a fairly, um, I think, alarmist uh, movement in some ways, where a lot of the discussions are focused on the worst case scenarios and the world ending, and a lot of times that turns people away. 
um, it makes people not want to get involved because they feel like they have to change their livelihoods completely or the world's going to like blow up in 12 years. And so that turns a lot of people away as well. Um, and so some didn't care about the environment and was a little bit frustrated with how the, the environmental movement was going about things. Um, that's why I thought it was really important that people would come together on the environment. Um, there are so many important environmental issues, uh, from climate change to conservation issues to energy issues, and they don't get enough attention and nothing really gets done because it's become such a polarized topic. But it didn't used to always be this way. Um, even Governor Tommy Thompson here in Wisconsin was a great governor on the issue of the environment. He set aside a lot of public land as a Republican, and he's actually on the board of the Wisconsin Conservative Energy Forum as well. Um, and Richard Nixon, a Republican, created the EPA. Um, Ronald Reagan set aside a bunch of land. Uh, George H.W. and George Bush uh, did a lot of work on the environment as well. George Bush actually set aside the largest marine sanctuary in the history of the United States. So it wasn't always partisan, and I'm sure people who have lived through the past few decades know that and have seen that firsthand. Um, but that's why it's really important to return to those roots of bipartisanship and bringing people together around it, because these issues are really important. I mean, our, back, our national parks are incredibly backlogged for funding, and there's obviously the climate change issue, which is on the horizon, and um, you know, transition to clean energy has a lot of um, you know, political issues. But those are things that are really important to a lot of people and don't get enough attention because of how polarized it's become. Um, so I want to go back to the question I had um, about conservatives, climate change, uh, climate skeptics, climate alarmists. There was a University of Michigan poll um, that was done in uh, 2017 that showed that climate skeptics were more eco-friendly in their day-to-day -day lives than climate alarmists. Um, and that, so that's what I was getting at with the initial question. Um, and what that meant was they were more likely to recycle and more likely to um, you know, save energy and, and turn off their water and whatever that may be, um, which to me showcases how this doesn't have to be a political issue. That even people who aren't on board with full-on climate change still want to protect the environment. It's not a negative towards people who do believe in climate change. It's actually a positive that both sides of that debate want to engage on the environment and both want to make a difference. And I think that that's something that a lot of people overlook. And additionally, if you look at, uh, and I mentioned this in a couple of classes today as well, if you look at an electoral map and you look at where conservatives vote, it's in the rural areas and the farming areas where the environmental problems are most seen. And farmers and people, ranchers and people in those areas are the ones who have stakes in the environment because they live there and they need it to be protected for the future of their family and the future of, of the economy of those, of those local regions. So the stereotype that conservatives don't care about the environment is something that I think has become wrong, but it's also something where conservatives haven't engaged enough on it and they kind of have deserved that stereotype because they haven't engaged enough on it. Um, so I think that looking past those stereotypes is really important. Um, and obviously here in Wisconsin, uh, we have really uh, strong conservation roots. Um, the first hydropower plant was in Appleton. We've got a lot of public land. Um, there's the Great Lakes and there's a lot of really important initiatives around the Great Lakes going on right now with uh, you know, ref uh, cleaning them up and uh, the Great Bay, Green Bay Initiative that Mike Gallagher and other stakeholders are taking on up there in the Northeast. Uh, so there's a reason to care for it here in the state and there's no way that we will have true environmental solutions without bipartisan support. And the reason why we haven't had environmental results for the past decade or two um, is partially because there, it's been so heavy-handed by one side that nothing has been able to get done. And without conservative involvement and conservatives realizing that this needs to be a super important issue and the left saying we want conservative involvement too, there's going to be few results on the environment. But 
if you're able to look past the stereotypes and realize that both sides are willing to get involved in this conversation, you realize that this is something that can be done because everyone wants to get involved. And I think that that's really, really vital to note. Um, so the American Conservation Coalition, which is my organization, um, is, is really trying to tackle that. Uh, we're on 120 college campuses nationwide trying to get young people uh, invested in the conservative movement with the environment. Um, we have a pretty strong voice in Congress. We recently helped launch a conservation caucus with conservative representatives um, working on national park bills and other types of conservation legislation. And we also are really just trying to change the dialogue that conservatives don't care about the environment. That this is something that should be bipartisan and should involve conservative type solutions and really gets conservatives going within their value set. Um, and it's been really exciting because college campuses are kind of seen as um, oftentimes a very liberal place. And oftentimes my conservative uh, friends will be like, oh, how do, you, how do you go to college campuses and, and talk about conservative values and, and not get heckled? And it's really interesting because on this issue, it brings down the wall that a lot of people have of each other. Because when somebody who's left of center realizes that somebody who's right of center cares about the environment, there's immediately a unique bond that they otherwise wouldn't have known about. And so I've been really inspired by that because a lot of my peers go to college campuses as conservatives and are often heckled and often you know, treated wrongly. But it's because there isn't that relatability like there is on a topic like the environment. And it's really inspiring to see that there, there can be that friendliness on a topic like the environment. Um, and in fact, our movement has become so strong that uh, 538, uh, ran by, or it's uh, founded by Nate Silver, who spoke here uh, for commencement, called us the, the uh, an article on their site said that our organization was the only hope uh, for climate change action in the next uh, 10, 15 years because they know that conservative involvement is crucial to solving this problem, at least in the United States, if not the globe, and that bipartisan solutions have to be a part of our future on these issues. Um, and so our organization has proven that one, this can be a bipartisan issue, and that both sides want to get involved and they want to make an impact on this issue and it's been really cool to see some of those stereotypes, like I keep mentioning, get broken. But it's also proven the impact that young people can have. Um, in all honesty, uh, I built uh, this organization with my team um, out of my fraternity room for the past three years. Um, and it's become a, a national organization that is making a huge impact. And everyone on our team is under the age of 25. And we're talking to members of Congress. We talk with the presidential administration. We're working with nonprofits on the left of center and the right of center. And we're doing it because people appreciate young activism. They appreciate young people getting active in politics. And it's inspiring to them because we're the next generation of leaders who can actually get something done. And in all honesty, millennials and Gen Z look past partisanship. They look past the, the political polarization that's going on, and in fact, they've been turned off by it. And that's why so many people in our generation don't get involved in politics, is because they've become so frustrated by the partisanship within um, our, our political uh, world. And so this is an issue where that can be different, and young people have powered our movement to the national stage because they want something different. They don't want nothing to happen on the environment. They want strong reforms that really um, you know, solve some of these deep problems in the environmental space. Um, and I think that the stereotype is that millennials and Generation Z are lazy and uneducated. Um, and, and to some degree, um, you know, I can see where people are coming from. But at the same time, if you look at Congress and you look at who are the most bold, strong, uh, innovative leaders, it's millennials who are in Congress. It's Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, it's Dan Crenshaw, the Republican from Texas, 
It's people who are leading the next generation of American politics, and they're almost all of them are willing to at least have conversations with the other side, and they're willing to call out their own party at the same time because they realize that this political world that we live in is past just, um, you know, past just the political divide that we have, and. As somebody who's been in politics for over half my life, which again is crazy to say as a 21-year-old, um, it, it is absolutely insane to see how much the peers that I've been able to associate with since that time, who are also young, because um, there's many more people out there like me, and, and myself, have been able to do in the political world just in 11 years, um, and from the ages 10 to 21. And people are always so shocked to see what young people can accomplish, but people listen to young voices, and they want young voices to be strong, and they want young voices to reach out, and that's where the power <coughs> is in politics right now. And so for anyone that isn't yet involved in politics but has some interest, I would strongly suggest that you get involved because it's something that you can make a massive difference on, and a lot of people just don't really realize it. Um, <coughs> And everything I've done has been a complete dream um, of mine. And, I, and actually, I was, I was talking earlier to Henrik and, and about how if I, was, if I was told in high school or middle school that I'd be going around and talking at campuses about the importance of, of youth involvement and coming together around common ground like the environment, um, I would have been shocked. And, and, and that's something that I've always wanted to do. But anyone can truly do it. And I think. My story is a testament to that. I mean, I've seen all sides of this and, and been through it at, at a young age of 10, but I've always been embraced, even though I talked about some of the negatives earlier, I've always been embraced by so many people in the political world because of my age, because people are, are, are wanting more young voices, and there just aren't enough. And so I think that's where the platform comes, and that's where anyone can truly do it. I'm the same age as a lot of people in here, um, but it's about balancing time. It's about, you know, I built it in a frat, um, and that's just something that it doesn't seem possible when you're going through college. It just doesn't seem possible that you could be that involved with school and that involved with politics and you know, have a social life, but it's completely possible, um, and that's something that, that's, that's vital to remember. And I also think that something that's really important to take away is that we need to drop the, the labels that we have in this country, not only because millennials want that, but because oftentimes they aren't true. Um, you get caught up in the hypes of politics, but you also have to step back and, and remember where normal people are at. The average person will agree with you way more than you think they will. And um, I was saying this earlier in classes as well, but everyone in this audience probably has a different political persuasion, and you probably agree on far more than you ever could imagine. Um, I, I mentioned the, the Sierra Club CEO experience earlier, and, uh, and, and other environmental organizations that I, that I got to communicate with um, over this past summer, and I went in thinking, oh my gosh, like I'm the only conservative here, and there's going to be you know, no way that we come out of here with any sort of um, you know, agreement, but it was absolutely amazing how much we ended up agreeing on, um, even though we were on opposite sides of the political aisle, and we probably work on completely opposite things, but we agreed on so many different goals and objectives, and the difference was on policy. And unfortunately, I think in politics today, we think that we disagree on the goals and the policy. And the fact of the matter is, is that most of us just disagree on the policy, and that's something that can be debated, and that's something that can be talked about in a long legislative session. But the goals are what we actually all hold together as people. Um, and we all care about the environment for the most part, and we all care about people for the most part, and we all care about jobs for the most part. And I think forgetting that is why we're in the political place that we are and why our politics has become so divided to the point where we think that we're at polar opposites and you know, some people you know, are, you know, want to secede or whatever it may be, that, that those extremes are getting more and more popular, but when you take a step back, you realize how much we do have in common. And even though the media hypes up you know, the, this divisive culture, 
there are dozens of bipartisan legislation that are being passed in Congress currently, and they're related to the environment, and they're related to jobs, and they're related to um, transportation and things that we all care about, but th that doesn't get the media. That doesn't get the social media or the media hype, even though they're out there. And it, it shouldn't take someone to go look for positive stories about bipartisan work, but it's happening. And I'm happy to go into that in the Q&A, but there's so many things going on in the bipartisan world that just don't get the attention. Um, and I would say also, just kind of leaving you with this, um, if, you, if you take anything away from my story and the work that we've been able to do at the ACC, it's that if you see something you don't like, you can go out and fix it. Because there's nothing holding back support and change and political uh, you know, coming together other than people not taking action. And especially in our generation, the millennial and Gen Z generation, it is so, so, so vital that we get involved because the more that we get involved, the better this political discourse is going to be. And I think not letting age define your work is what's been able to help me propel my career in politics and what I've been able to see other people do the same. And that age at this point in this political space doesn't matter and it can't define anything. Um, and millennials and Generation Z have already done more than any other youth generation could have ever dreamed of. So I think that's also just something that we have to remember as we're looking at our political world. And bipartisanship is the only way forward. It's how we were built as Americans. It's how the American government was built. Um, it's about working together despite disagreements. And if we want to become a better country, and if we want to come together in the environment, and we want uh, to make a better future for our kids, we need to kind of drop the labels, drop the politics, and realize that bipartisanship is there, it's ready, it's ripe. This movement that we have at ACC has been growing so quickly that I couldn't even imagine because people are just waiting for it. And so I would urge you to get involved in as many bipartisan things as possible um, and, and really try to make a difference in your communities as we go forward. Um, so thank you all uh, for coming and listening. I, I'm hopeful that the question and answer can be very informative, um, and, uh, and I look forward to taking your questions. Uh, thank you, Benji. If um, <clears throat> people don't mind, uh, I will ask just one, one brief question, like hopefully I'm not sure how brief it will be, but I want to talk about policies for a second, right? Because uh, I wanted to talk. I wanted to ask you, sort of, where do you see sort of the common ground in specific policies that uh, the ACC is advocating for? But also, what are the limits, right? I mean, your organization is really advocating for more free market solutions, right? So, not everybody is going to, you know, jump and says, "Oh, we're we're on board." So, talk about both um, some common ground as well as some limitations. Yeah. So then the common ground can be really easily found on conservation. Um, conservation is a really easy issue for people to agree upon. Um, you look at hunters and fishers all the way to like the park rangers and, and people, and those people probably have very different political views, but they both agree that public lands are important and they both agree that um, conservation should be funded. And so that's some place where even on policy, there's a lot of agreement. Um, so I think that that's something, and again, conservatives haven't been involved enough on those issues recently, um, even though they championed them at one point. And it's in the name, right? Conservatives and conservation, it's, it's definitely in the name. Um, and so I think that that's some place where there's a policy agreement. Where there might not be is how other issues get dealt with, like climate change, right? So. You know, conservatives who are on board with climate change, you know, usually understand that there needs to be some sort of common sense government, um, you know, policy. But it's usually a lot more, um, you know, it's a lot more, uh, it's a lot less government intrusive than what the left would propose. So that's where the policies would differ. But then I, again, when you get caught up in the policy differences and you don't realize that you're at the same time working for the same goal, you're never going to find a happy medium. And I think that a lot of these policies, like on climate change or on energy, will have to come from happy mediums. 
And until you realize that the goals are the same, even though the policies are different, you're never going to come to that happy medium because you're just going to think that what the other side is proposing is completely anti what you believe, even though it's looking for the same goal. Thank you. Um, questions? Yeah. I'm really appreciative of your enthusiasm for this. It reminds me of those heady days back in the 60s <laughs> when you could have a protest every day about something. Gay rights, women's rights, black rights, the environment, anti-war. You take the weekend off, you do some things. The <laughs> end point of this is sustainability of the environment. Right. I want my grandkids right. I just visited that are under five and their grandkids who are way out in the future to have an environment. And it has to be sustainable for those future environments. But that means we have to have a policy that works. Yeah. And that work doesn't work. And right now, it doesn't work. And the policy has always had the construct of making, uh, of being made by who controls the money. <coughs> That's the real, comes, really comes down to it. So I'm thinking of Ralph Nader and Unsafe at Any Speed. Um, 1962 with um, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. The CFC controversy, I wrote these down, the soap and detergent industry, tobacco, uh, and now big oil, mm -hmm. all were dragged, well, oil's not done yet, and coal, <laughs> have been, were dragged kicking and screaming <coughs> against having any policy that would disrupt them. And what did they do? They threw money at it to stop the policy. So, here's my question. How do you get money out of policy? Really good question. I'd actually say, and this at first will sound bad, but I'll say this. I don't think you're going to get money out of policy. But the way to counteract it is with voices. And so, something that I've learned, and, and I also shared this with classes today, is that I've talked to a lot of Congress people who told me that if they even heard from four or five of their constituents on a certain policy that they would have thought about voting a different way because, but, but they didn't hear from their constituents on the policies, or at least the ones that vote for them. And so that's, that's the fault of a lot of times of conservative constituents who don't reach out on the environment and say, hey, we know that you know, there's some special interest groups, but at the same time, we believe that we want clean air and clean water, and they don't hear that. Um, and so I think, obviously, you know, the money is definitely an issue in politics. There's no doubt about it, and it's, it is corrupting the system. But the, the best way to go about it is to build movements around campaigns that might go against the big money. Because pe politicians care about money, but they also care about votes more because they care about getting elected. And if you're able to get enough people to, to advocate for something, they're going to listen, especially people who vote for them usually. And and young people are even stronger. So I would say that's, that's my answer. And in terms of getting money out of it, I think that's just something that, with the system we have right now, is, is really difficult to do. Um, and that's why I think having more mo grassroots movements and more coordination with Congress and state legislatures and local legislatures is the best way to combat that at this time. Um, and I don't think that there's enough heavy involvement from Americans in the government. Not, most people don't even vote, let alone go out there and advocate for something they believe in to their representative. And that's the beauty of our democracy and our republic, that we are able to do that, but we don't utilize it. And so I think that's the best way forward, in my opinion, for where we're at. Yeah? Um, so you use the term climate awareness. Very yeah. Um, could you just kind of define that, and also does kind of using language like that only increase the divide that was so you know prevalent before, and kind of the environmental movement as a whole? So, yeah. So, so, so first of all, that was the question. Yeah. So the question was, or the question was basically saying that the the word climate alarmist, which I used earlier, is something that divides the environmental or it divides people from the environmental community and makes them, you know, it basically creates a further divide, right? And, and why keep using that term? Yeah, so I think 
First of all, th that was more in reference to the, the poll that was done in, by the University of Michigan that said that climate alarmists, and that's the word that they used, were less eco-friendly in their day-to-day -day lives than climate skeptics. Um, so I think, that, like, I usually wouldn't say that environmental, you know, people who are in the environmental community are climate alarmists, because that's just not true. Most people have the same goals and, it, you know, who are in the environmental community and want things to get done. It's the people who are, I think, unfortunately, on the far left and the far right who dominate political discussion, at least at this point in time. And a lot of times, I think what they're getting at in the climate alarmist poll is that climate alarmists are like the types of people who say that the world will end, you know, we have to do something right now and that the world's going to end, you know, in 12 years. Um, and that that scenario is 0.1% of a chance um, in most of the studies that are done. Most studies that are done for the majority of uh, like the IPCC report um, are show that this is something that's serious. Climate change is definitely serious and needs to be tackled. But that we have some time, and we have a lot of climate scientists at the University of Washington that I've taken classes from that say the exact same thing. And the IPCC report and the climate change report from the United Nations also says that if you look at it. It's just the worst case scenario that says that it's you know something that the world's going to end in 12 years. So I think that's what it's getting at. Um, but that's just you know I, I also think that it is a divisive word, alarmist. And um, but I also think that there are certain people who are in the environmental community who don't want to work with conservatives because of that stereotype and vice versa. And I think that though that that's also very damaging. Um, and to, to to kind of end that point conservatives and liberals have to be able to put aside you know, the differences that they might have on the end of the world scenarios versus it's not happening at all scenarios and try to find you know, that middle ground at least somewhat. Yeah, the, the flip side of climate alarmists is climate deniers. So right. the, the denier term is used to try to diminish any, any uh, technical questions that other people have on the opposite side of things. So really both, both right. extremes play that game against the other. Exactly. So climate deniers is, and that was the point I just made. Climate deniers is the same as climate, or it's the opposite of climate alarmists, and they're both out there. Um, you know, there are people who are part of both of those camps, and I think it's a very small percentage, but a lot of times they dominate the conversation, um, which is because they're the loudest voices. I think. Yeah. There was a question over here. So, what step would you say that you, along with the American Conservation Coalition, would support certain types of government regulation and could you do you have any examples of specific conservation or environmental legislation or regulation that you would support within this organization yes the question was basically with personally and as the ACC what kinds of conservation um, and environmental regulations would we support um, there's no doubt that there needs to be regulation on environmental issues. There's no doubt about that. And a lot of the times where we've come as a country um, on the environment is because of like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, um, you know, back in the 70s and 80s. So I think that that's, um, as an organization, we think that there needs to be common sense regulation um, and not overbearing regulation. Because a lot of times regulation has also hurt the environment. Um, and so I'll give an example of both, of, of something that we would like support now and not support now. Um, you look at the Endangered Species Act, and we think that's really important, but we also think that it needs to be changed a little bit because only 2% of species have been delisted since the 1980s, um, the early 1980s. And even though like the preface of it is good, the pre or the premise of it is good, the policy itself is so overbearing that people who have private lands and have animals on them end up shooting and killing them because they don't want the government regulation that comes with having that animal on that land. So that doesn't mean overhauling the Complete Endangered Species Act or not having any regulation towards endangered species. It's making it more common sense so people can be more interactive because, again, private landowners have a stake in their land and they want to take care of it. And if they have an incentive to do the right thing rather than a regulation, it's proven that the majority of the time that would be that would be a good thing. And a lot of times you look at like the forest fires, a lot of times the forests are very undermanaged. The national parks have a $10 billion deficit. And that's not to say I mean, we definitely need national parks and they need to be protected, in my opinion, and, and in our opinion, from the federal government. But it hasn't been done effectively enough. And so it's trying to come up with effective government solutions that 
maybe involve the public and the private sector together to work together. And a really good example of something that we support is the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, which is in Congress right now, and it takes oil and gas money, um, tax dollars, and puts it back into state wildlife agencies um, to better protect the, the wildlife in those. So that's like a perfect example of how you have companies engaging with the government, engaging with state wildlife agencies, and like that's something that we need more of, in my opinion. Um, so that's a good example of one, and I think that there's a lot more ways to do things like that, including with our national parks and um, in climate change and other issues. Um, it's just a matter of finding those proposals and making sure that it's common sense regulation, not no regulation, just also not over regulation. Hey, thanks for coming to my class earlier. Today. Yes. <laughs> and everybody, if you're fascinated by environmental psychology, I have to teach it so they can course <laughs> Here's my real question, though. Yes. You talk about environmental conservation. To me, the other piece of this agenda is environmental justice, right? And yeah. we have a lot of communities who are receiving environmental risks disproportionately in this country, specifically communities of color and low-income communities, who don't really have this voice, right? We also happen to know, based on some studies that are just coming up, that inequality leads to worse environmental outcomes, perhaps because these communities do not have a voice, right? So as a party that is largely all white male, yeah. uh, is this a part of your agenda? How are you hoping to address this issue in the future? Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll be frank, I, before I went to this, I, and this is the third time I'm reference it, but that environmental uh, event last summer with, with environmental leaders, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't think that in, uh, inequality or Poverty could play any role with the environment. I really didn't. But then I got to sit down with people who were from those communities, and uh, it really opened my eyes. Um, it was it was kind of shocking how like actually shocking how privileged I realized I was. Um, and I'll be the first to admit that. So I believe that it's a big issue, and that people in you know people of color and people in you know, urban areas that might live in poverty and, you know, live near water or, um, you know, in areas like that where they can't afford to have natural disasters, um, you know, hit their home because they don't have the types of insurance or, you know, they don't have the, the money to relocate or whatever it may be. It affects them more than anyone in the entire country and the globe. Um, you know, places, people in other countries who live in poverty and can't afford it have even worse issues than, than the people here in the United States. So. I think it's a major issue, first of all, um, and, and I think conservatives have to do a far better job of reaching out to minorities. They do a terrible job of reaching out to minorities, um, and there's a reason why they don't support conservative ideologies, and it's just because we don't try to relate to them and try to understand the problems they go through, and I didn't for a while either. Um, so. I think that conservatives have to do a lot, a, a much better job of that. And in terms of our work, um, the EPA actually, um, and, and the EPA that right now actually just launched a social justice program um, to help communities of color with climate change. And you may not like Administrator Wheeler or the Trump administration. But that was one of the things that I really thought was really good. And, and uh, he just announced the program, so I don't know the exact details of it yet. Um, but it's, it's the first time that that's been done. Um, and so I think he realizes it, and I know him, and I think that he realizes it, and I think that uh, as an organization, that's something that we will be doing more of in the future. Um, let's go with the American President. <coughs> oh, thank you. Uh, I was curious about this, this goals versus policy distinction that yeah. Cameron also put It seems to me that there's lots of goals we agree with, right? Um, and the, the real politics is always going to have policy. So we, we all would agree with the goal we should end racism, right? right. We all would agree with the goal we should you know, uh, end poverty. Right. We should end obesity. <clears throat> Everyone would agree about that. Where we get at each other is this distinction between whether these are individual, primarily individual problems or systemic problems, mm -hmm. right? So how do we end racism from a conservative point of view? We should stop paying attention to race. Individuals who are racist should stop being racist. Liberals would say this is a systemic problem with deep roots in history and we have to make major changes in our society, yep. right? Same thing would be the case for poverty, right? Poverty, how do we solve it? Charity, individuals work harder. For liberals, it would be structures of inequality, changing the economy, right? Yep. Caring for our environment is like that, right? 
We all care for the environment. We can't have any common sense solution to caring for the environment that we would all agree about without having to get, get into this deep political argument about what that means, whether it's a systemic problem that requires massive changes in how we live, or an individual problem that we can solve by recycling, right? right. And I don't see how, how, how we have that real conversation in the way you're describing as you know, above politics or nonpartisan because that's having that argument is what we have to do. Yeah, so, so the question was basically, um, or he pushed back a little bit on my premise of that we, we don't share the same goals or that we, we, um, we see that we don't see that we share the same goals and that we actually should just be having a really deep policy conversation about it. Um, that's, the, that's the short of it. And I would push back a little bit on that and saying that I think on, on an issue like um, on obesity or something, people I think overall realize that both sides agree that that's something that is an issue. But I, I mean, the amount of times that I've been told, especially before I got active in this, that conservatives didn't care about the environment is insane. I've been told that so many times. And I've been told by people on the, you know, by people on the right that the left doesn't care about jobs. And I do think that most people in this country hold stereotypes of the different goals, and I think that that's something that we have to get past. Because there are so many stereotypes on those goals, whether it be immigration or gay rights, the amount of times that I've been told that I wasn't, you know, for gay rights, um, you know, or that I didn't, that I hated gay people just because I was conservative. It's a lot, it happens a lot. And so you're rational, and you're realizing that those stereotypes aren't true, but a lot of people don't actually believe that. And they can't get past that. And so what I'm saying is you've got to get past that, and you've got to realize that we do share similar goals before you can ever get to a policy discussion. And I actually believe that those shared goals are something that we haven't gotten to yet as a country in realizing. But you're right, the, the, the policy discussion is important, but you've got to re you've got to have some sort of mutual respect for one another before you have a political policy dialogue. And we don't have that yet in this country, in my opinion. We think that the other side is the devil and that they have different types of, uh, of goals and that they are kind of just snakes slithering around trying to you know, hammer us uh, from behind on some sort of thing that we're trying to do for the better of you know, a, a community or the country. And so I totally agree with you that the policy discussions are absolutely vital and there's no way that you get anything done without policy discussions, but in my opinion, we're not there yet in this political <coughs> discourse because so many people hold those objectives and I'm the first one to have seen it. I was called a racist by my freshman and high school teacher because she thought that I was, uh, you know, just because I was conservative, she thought I was a racist. And people held those beliefs about me when I went out to Seattle. And that's the farthest thing from the truth. So you've got to get past those, go those, 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 the, the, diff the, the, the belief that we share different goals before you can ever get to a policy discussion. And then you have a great policy discussion, like I had with these environmental CEOs, because they finally realized that as a conservative, I cared about the same thing they did. And we found common ground by the end of it. And yeah, we had some different ideas, but you can have some individual responsibility and some government together. We've done that throughout American history. We're going to continue to do it. And if we don't, we're not going to get things done. Thank you. Other other questions? I would prefer to have more student questions. Uh, I think that's right. Sure. Well, there's one right there. Yeah, you've made uh, the statement quite a few times that like everyone really, really wants to get involved with helping the environment. Yeah. And so I guess my question is, aside from the uh, political polarization that you've touched on, yeah. if there are so many people who are so interested in getting involved in sustainability and protecting the environment, why haven't they gotten involved yet? Yeah, so the question was if everyone wants to get involved with environmental sustainability, in environmental sustainability why haven't they? Great question. Um, and it's because they, it, there's actually a really great piece on this that you can look up. It's called, uh, so it, it, it's about solution aversion um, and how conservatives, well, conservative leaders haven't created their own solutions recently on the environment. So the only ones that are out there are left of center solutions. And so if a conservative doesn't believe in left of center solutions, they're not going to want to get involved in that topic. And so it's, conservatives' fault that we haven't put together solutions um, that resonate with our own base. Um, but it's also the fact that they just, they, they want to get involved, but they don't have an outlet to do so. And they're, they don't like the solutions that are out there, so they decide, you know what, I, I'm just going to drop it. And they might even go the opposite way and say that the environment's just fine, and that we, we don't need to do anything about it. 
And I think, again, that's at the fault of conservatives for not being willing to put together our own policy proposals. But that's why people don't get involved, because it just doesn't interest them, because why would they get involved with something that they disagree with the solutions on? Um, and that, that's been a, that's a, been a decade, a two decade long effect, I think. I think it started in the early 2000s. Um, and lastly, the last thing, and I know you have maybe like a follow-up question, um, <coughs> is that climate change has kind of dominated the dialogue, and for a lot of people, that is such a divisive issue that they don't want to get involved with conservation or other important environmental issues because when you think of the environment, you think of climate change and that's really all that's dominating the dialogue. And not only has that pushed people away who maybe have religious views or something that, that doesn't bring them to the climate change debate, especially like old, older people and, and people who, who are in different communities, but it also makes it so there aren't uh, discussions on important issues regarding the environment that don't have to do with climate change. And so we don't talk about conservation anymore, even though it's really important, because climate change is dominating everything. And so that turns people away as well. Do you follow up? Um, I'll let somebody else answer okay. I'm still formulating. Okay. Yeah. We have one other time for one or two more questions. Okay. Uh, I know that, well, let us, if you don't oh, yeah. mind, I'll go to the student. Yeah. Or, go ahead. Me, okay, so the fact that your flyer says that you're committed to protecting the environment and growing the economy, in what ways? And how do you think that capitalism and sustainability can coexist? Like, do you think consumerist culture can coexist with sustainability? Yeah, I really like that question too. So can consumer culture and sustainability and capitalism and sustainability work together and why? And do we believe that? Um, and the answer is yes, I think it can. Um, the United States is, is in 2017, led the world in emissions reduction. We don't have a massive climate policy. Um, it was nowhere near enough um, by, any, by any stretch of imagi imagination, um, but it did happen. And um, that's partially because as consumers, everyone probably in this room is demanding, whether you know it or not, more eco-friendly ways. Um, we want a, a cleaner future. And so uh, there's actually a study done also that showed that um, our generation is more willing to spend money on eco-friendly products. Um, and then spend less money and buy something that wasn't as <coughs> eco-friendly. That type of consumer demand change has led companies to change the way that they do things. 150 of the largest companies have pledged to go 100% renewable. Um, and that's not because of a government mandate, that's because they realize that they have to do it. Um, and a lot of times it saves money um, because clean energy is becoming cheaper. So I think that they can go hand in hand. I believe that they already are going hand in hand. You look at the shift to the Prius and electric cars and people want to save money and be environmentally sustainable. Um, and that's something that is really good for the environment and really good for the economy and it grows. Um, and I think it'll just keep getting better. And again, it's not to say that there doesn't need to be any government policy, but I, say, I would say that they go hand in hand and that they can work together and you have to take that into consideration when you're looking at a government policy that the economy is starting to shift towards a greener future because it's, it's what consumers want and it's because it's cheaper for a lot of companies. And you've had your hand up for a while, yeah. so I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. answer the question. Right. Um, this, it was actually set up, that was a great question because that's part of where I wanna go. Yep. Um, a couple things. One, just a point of clarification about the 12 year thing. Yeah. The 12 year issue is we have 12 years before we're getting close to a point of possibly no return and going beyond the two degree and getting up into three to four degrees. And we may already be there. So we won't experience the end of the world, but we'll be on a trajectory to a really disastrous world. That seems to be what the consensus is about the data. That's still based on the worst case scenario though. If you look deeply at the IPCC well, reports and the UN well, reports, the vast majority of percentages for what's going to happen don't fall within that scenario. Well, we can have that discussion another time. But well, that matters. That's, that well, does no, no, matter. I know it matters, but there are a lot of scientists and a lot of data and a lot of reports of people who've also gone into that data who say that that's not quite the case. I mean, it's not just a worst case scenario saying we have 12 years to turn things around in global emissions because we're still churning out way more CO2. And the CO2 that's in the atmosphere right now, without, if we stop dead on a dime, we still risk going over 2% and going even farther than that.
So, I mean, it, that's a factual matter. The, the more substantive matter that I wanted to get at is two issues in your about us, and that is, I don't, I, and I think this is, I think Naomi Klein was right in her book, This Changes Everything. And that's that the right is right about climate change in that if we believe that climate change is a reality, it's going to require a total change in economic presuppositions because a finite planet cannot have an economic system that's predicated on continual exponential growth. 5% of the world's population cannot continue, continue to consume 30% of its resources and have any kind of just distribution throughout the world and expect to kind of continue on. So at a certain level, it's a question of economics. I mean, yes, I agree that companies are trying to get greener, but if we're still just buying more and more stuff, I had a class count how many cell phones they had in their lifetime. A class of 20 students generated 120 cell phones in the span of up to 18 to 20 year olds. You multiply that times their lifetime times 300 million. We cannot sustain it. And that's just the United States. So yeah. at a certain level, I think you, you have to deal with the economic issue much more strongly. And then secondly, the small government principles, I don't think that's going to be effective with multinational corporations. Because multinational corporations, they can just rearrange where they shift the pollution and where they shift manufacturing. And so the, you need more than just small government to really address the deep issues. So. Okay, so the just briefly summarizing, and then I'll, I'll also briefly answer, but I'd love to get deeper. Um, yeah, so uh, basically that capitalism and like the current economic structure won't be sustainable if we want to curb climate change. That's the long and short of it. Um, and I would say that there definitely needs to be a systematic change in the way that we approach the environment and the economy. But the, I don't believe that there's any way of doing that without more innovation and more technology to figure out how to get more green types of cars and more green types of energy so we can all sustain life here. We aren't, we aren't going to be able to do it with what we have now. We're living off coal and, and oil and natural gas. We can't get off that right now, especially in third world countries. And the only way for us to start transitioning is to increase the technology and increase the innovation, and you're not gonna do that without growing an economy. So I think that that's really important uh, when you're looking at this. And additionally, you talk about smartphones, that, that's, that's important, but you also have to realize the good that smartphones have done for the environment, how much paper they've saved, and because you're all, always using, like I don't even take notes on paper anymore. I have everything on my one iPhone, and the amount of waste that I don't generate because of this is incredible. I, I, I save energy by decreasing how much air conditioning and, and heating I'm using while I'm not at my house, um, because I can do that, because it's on my phone. Um, so I, I get where you're coming from, but, and I, and I totally agree that it's not sustainable where 30%, um, of our resources are being used by 5% of our, of our population. But the only way that we go past that is to improve countries and innovate them and get them caught up to speed so we can have a better and greener economy. And I think the 150 companies going 100% renewable, many of whom are multinational enterprises, is a really good uh, showcase that it can happen and it already is happening. And the only way they're doing that is because of economic growth and innovation that's allowed them to get to that point. They wouldn't have been able to do that 20 years ago. I'll take over here at this point. Uh, I know that there are more questions, no doubt. Uh, maybe we can have a chat a little bit, you know, after after the event. Uh, but we have to we have to end uh, at this point. So I want to really thank everyone for for coming. It's uh, been wonderful to to hear your questions and to see you active here. Um, I also want to announce our next event. Uh, this one will be on April 17th, uh, 
at 4.30 here in the same room. It'll be about protesting, personal experiences and views on protesting. Um, Professor Miller will be here and a couple of students will be debating and should be pretty lively. So we hope to see many of you um, at that event. So thanks, uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.